you guys dealing with? Yeah, I have her call in. She still hasn't called in yet. And I have her validate that she's actually getting the audio in her system. Check, check, test one, two, test one, two. Yeah. Check, check, check one, two. What changed in the world while you were sleeping? What happened down the street, across the country, and three oceans away? Since the last time you ate breakfast. Your world may not have changed much since yesterday. But our world is changing every minute. And we'll be there every morning to keep you on top of it. You're listening to Morning Edition from NPR News. Listen every weekday. So what is the Democracy Initiative? There are a number of key components. At the heart of it is a study of the history and philosophy and principles of democracy from the most ancient historical times through the present. But we want to be sure that that study of philosophical conceptions and historical experiments is surrounded by and energizes a series of what we're calling democracy labs. So we'll have faculty members, postdocs, PhDs, other graduate students and undergraduates focusing on big topics and big questions that are facing democracy. As we look at these issues, we also help our students understand the role that they have to play in democracy, no matter what their field or interest is. The University of Virginia believes that we have a responsibility to address the challenges that face democracy, both at home and abroad, right now.
Well, good morning, everyone. This is a great day, and it follows a wonderful day as the first day of the Presidential Ideas Fest, and we need to keep the momentum going this morning, and so uh, it is no accident, accident that Larry Sabato will moderate a wonderful panel uh, dealing with the issues that are going to arise out of the 2020 elections. My name is Rusty Connor. I have the dis distinct privilege of serving as rector of the university, uh, and I welcome all of you, and I particularly want to thank all of our panelists for being here. Um, this is an um, extraordinary panel and one that we are want to get to very, very quickly. Um, we're going to talk about the big ideas in the 2020 elections. The first one really is, um, what are the major issues on the minds of voters? What are the issues that we will ultimately have to grapple with? Who will emerge from the uh, Democratic primaries as the nominee? Good luck on that. And what we can expect from the general election, an even more difficult question. Um, four panelists moderated by one of the uh, institutions in this institution of Larry Sabato. Uh, we start with Chris Matthews. Everyone knows him as Hardball with Chris Matthews. This is his 25th anniversary uh, on television dealing with uh, political issues. <laughs> also, Peace Corps volunteer and speechwriter for Jimmy Carter. Carl Rove, the former White House uh, Deputy Chief of Staff under George W. Bush, um, noted political um, commentator and political historian. He wrote a wonderful book on William McKinley, and I commend that book to your reading. Amy Walter is the national editor of the Cook Political Report, and she appears regularly on the PBS NewsHour. And Jamal Bowie, a journalist and columnist with the New York Times, most importantly about him, he is a graduate of this institution. <laughs> and And he is a Charlottesville resident. And of course, everyone knows Larry Sabato. If you do not know Larry Sabato, you probably shouldn't be in this audience. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. He's in charge of everything. And if you need anything, money, uh, grants, whatever, uh, email him. Okay, he, he's the one. Look, we're looking forward to, to this panel, or I'm certainly looking forward to it, because I respect all four of these people tremendously, and they are great, as you're going to see. And we're going to make them answer some tough questions, some pointed questions. The first one, so you can be thinking, is who will be the Democratic nominee? And don't give me, it might be this one, it might be that one. No, none of that stuff. Oh we're going to, I'm going to pretend I'm Chris Matthews, and I'm going to drag it out of you, each one of you. Uh, Actually, I'm not going to do that, but uh, if I, I, those were short uh, introductions. These are incredibly distinguished people, but you have long bios uh, in, your, uh, in your papers and online. You can go online and see it, and I think your programs have it as well. So we're going to save a little time there because we have exactly now 56 and a half uh, minutes, and that includes a couple of your questions at the end. So we're going we're to speed this along. Now look, uh, panel. Last time I checked, and I wasn't able to read the paper this morning, but, so there may be a 25th or 26th Democratic candidate for president, but last time I checked, there were 24. Uh, if we gave each candidate two minutes, that would be the end of our time. So uh, most of them don't deserve 30 seconds, much less two minutes. We're going to focus. I, I which one, great which people, but I'm just saying, Larry. let's get real here. Which ones <laughs> don't deserve 30 seconds? I'm not, I don't that, have that'll time show for that, half Chris. Of our time. Don't make I don't list. have time to go through it. Chris, this is not hardball. I'm in charge. Okay? I'm the moderator. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, as you look at this field, everybody knows, you know, Biden is, is leading, he's the front runner, which could be a very precarious place to be in any nominating race, and particularly one with a field this large. Do you think, and we're guessing, do you think that he will be able to sustain his leading role on the Democratic side? And if he is seriously challenged in the end, which two or three candidates do you think might be the key challenger? And let's start with Amy. Oh, oh okay. Oh, I was hoping that you would start with someone else. That's when I was doing one of those like. 
I know it from the classroom. Sure, I know it from the classroom. Look down on your on your desk. It doesn't work. <laughs> I should have known better than that. First of all, thank you um, for hosting this. This has been uh, this is really a tremendous opportunity for me as well as for all of you to hear from some really thoughtful people. I'm not necessarily putting myself in that category, but the number of people who have come here and helped to give us some perspective, which is what we desperately need more and more in this era of being inundated and bombarded by tweets and all of the social media stuff coming at us, sort of step back a minute. I, to, to your point about um, Biden as the front runner, you're right, He's a, in many ways he is a solid front runner, but also a very fragile front runner, right? He has the rare distinction, not just that he has name recognition, but he's well liked among pretty much every single group within the Democratic establishment or the Democratic primary electorate. So there's not like a gaping hole there. He's not as well liked among the very liberal voters, but he's not disliked among that group. His challenge right now seems to me that his rationale for running, which he himself says is because he sees Donald Trump as an existential threat, he is an anomaly, he says, and I am the person who can beat him. And then he can point to polling, which we've seen in recent days in places like Pennsylvania, a key swing state for this election, where he's handily beating Donald Trump in a matchup. Vote for me, I may not be the most exciting guy in the race. I've likened it to, to me, Joe Biden is the candidate of one of those casual but nice restaurants that you take your whole family to because everybody's gonna find something they like on the menu. Applebee's? Kind of like Applebee's. The Applebee's candidate, that's great. He's kind of like Applebee's. You're not, this is not the greatest meal you ever had. You're not leaving hungry, but you didn't take a risk. You know, you're not like, oh, it's not sushi, right? Like, kids won't eat anything that's not grilled cheese or whatever. And, um, you kind of leave going, okay, that was fine. But for Democratic primary voters who their number one priority is making sure that the candidate they pick can beat Donald Trump, he fits that bill. The challenge for him is twofold. I think he's gonna get challenged whether he likes it or not by Bernie Sanders, who's gonna come after him in the same way he did against Hillary Clinton. That's how Sanders runs, right? He's the, um, he's the candidate of the anti-establishment. The only way he gets oxygen is by um, using the candidate of the establishment as a foil. Um, we'll see what happens with the, I think there are two or three other candidates who, especially if those two are engaging each other, can kind of come up, um, who are lower in the polls right now, but could find their way to move up. Beto O'Rourke being one of those, Pete Buttigieg <coughs> being another one, and Kamala Harris. Those are the three that I sort of look at as that next tier of candidates they haven't really broken through. Elizabeth Warren fits in to a certain extent there, but she and Bernie Sanders are also kind of competing for a lot of the same voters. Do you see anyone in the bottom 15 or so? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there are some new candidates. We know it isn't de Blasio, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, the governor of Montana seems like a nice fellow. I'm not sure what his constituency is, but you, you look at the that bottom 15. Is there anybody there with breakout potential? I, I, I don't see it right now. I mean, you know, if you're somebody like Amy Klobuchar, where on paper you have a really good story to tell about sort of being Biden-esque, it would require Biden collapsing. Mm and then you can have a moment where you say, for those people who are so worried about an electable candidate or somebody who can appeal to the middle, somebody who can win in the Midwest, who right, has a track record of success, I've won in purple state year after year, she has a message there, but I don't know, as Carl knows better than anybody, the process is really long. You can, there's only so long you can wait, and these guys are gonna have a whole lot of trouble raising money and being able to sustain a campaign going through the summer. Well, there's Twitter. You know, yeah. That's free. But you still gotta people be able to get it. on a plane yeah. to go to places <laughs> and pay a couple people to help you out. Um, you can use Twitter to a certain extent, but these things are really, really, really expensive and I don't think a lot of candidates, well, we'll find out, but they don't know that they necessarily appreciated that running for president, the amount of money that it takes to make this a real deal. It's not something you can do just over Twitter or getting on online fundraising. Sure. Carl, um, 
you are one of the few people in American history uh, who has, uh, like your, your uh, idol, Mark Hanna, who has elected a president not, not, not my, twice. Not well, you know, look, they, they don't know the Charles details. Just swallow it. They don't know yeah, the yeah. details. Uh, <laughs> he wrote a great book on William accurate. McKinley, which I enjoyed. But look, uh, you, you elected a president twice, which, you know, very, very few people have done. And in 2004, while the field wasn't nearly as big on the Democratic side as it is now, you faced a kind of similar situation uh, in that the president, uh, President Bush, had not been elected with the popular vote. Uh, the president uh, was in a controversial war. Now, we're not in a controversial war now, but I think it's fair to say Donald Trump is just plain controversial. You can, you can get rid of the war. He's just controversial. So there's something similar there, or maybe there isn't. How do you see the Democratic contest? Well, first, first of all, with 24,000 candidates, it's difficult to pick out how it's actually going to play out. <laughs> and, and look, it's a fool's errand right now. Yeah. I mean, if you describe what you think is going to happen, we're working with today's information. And this campaign, more than any I've seen in my lifetime, is going to depend upon the individual performance of the individual campaigns over a sustained period of time. But I'm, I'm with Amy. I think Biden on paper and Biden in the first month of his campaign has done well, and I think he's the most likely nominee. But he is in a position of vulnerability, and, and as Amy said, you know, money is going to matter in this, because the money that the, an opponent is going to need mm -hmm. is going to be the money needed to build an organization in Iowa that, that allows him to do, allows somebody to do to Biden what happened to Hillary Clinton with Barack Obama in 2008. You remember, the national poll showed her with a 30-point lead until she lost Iowa, and then the polls closed and we had a sustained contest. And I think that the same thing could happen here. Biden could, if Biden gets upset in Iowa, uh, whoever upsets him is gonna be a player. Uh, and I'm, I'm, look, Julian Castro, not gonna go anywhere. You know, uh, Hickenlooper, he's Hickenloopered out. Uh, <laughs> Bullock, you know, head back to Montana. Uh, but what surprised me is, is two things. One is, as Biden went up in the polls, uh, Bernie went down. And it was sort of like you saw a lot of people saying, well, I was for Bernie, but I think Biden is better, which says to me, maybe they're, they're sort of Democrats who want to win so badly, they're willing to say, I'm, you know, he, he, he was in favor of, you know, uh, he was opposed to busing. He was in favor of, you know, uh, uh, the Hyde Amendment, but, you know, by God, and he voted for the Iraq War, you know, voted against the first Iraq War, which he should have, but he voted for the second Iraq War, which he shouldn't have, but by God, he can win, which makes him a little bit vulnerable. But the other thing is, is that uh, Robert Francis O'Rourke failed to learn the lesson, you get one chance to introduce yourself. Kamala Harris started off nice, but has faded and is now out there getting nutty. And Elizabeth Warren has been the candidate who sort of stuck in there and has a message, which is, I got a plan for that. And, and by God, we may not like the plans, but there'll be an element inside the Democratic Party that will. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. I wonder, what do you think of this? I thought that with 24 candidates, uh, a lot of people said, well, the vote will be so divided and they'll be so disunified and it's going to be awful. Uh, maybe having 24 candidates actually helps Biden in that it has uh, instilled some fear in a lot of Democrats that, my God, if we don't get this together, we're going to reelect Donald Trump by being so disunified. Oh, yeah. one, one rank and file Democrat, this is interesting, uh, who's a very liberal Democrat, you know, way on the, I think he's to the left of Bernie. He came up to me recently, he says, you know, I'm gonna shock you. He says, if the Democrats nominate a bar stool, I'm voting for the bar stool. Uh, <laughs> That's rare. Well, that's what happened in 2018. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly People right. were yeah. voting. The, the Democrats, even on the very liberal end, were voting for very moderate Democrats. They were turning out for the not ex exactly inspiring candidates. It wasn't about the Democrat. It was about Trump. Yeah, that's, that is absolutely true, the, the, and it may one, be that way again. The one problem with that is, is that may happen if it's a Joe Biden, 
but the real voters who will decide this election are not the basis of each party. Each party's base is going to go into this election revved up and turning out at record numbers. It's going to be that small number of truly swing voters, independents in the middle. I don't know whether it's 10 percent or 12 percent or 15 percent. Sure as hell ain't 20 percent. But that group of voters are going to be the kind of people who say, OK, I'm, I, can buy, I can find myself voting for Joe. He's the crazy uncle at the Summy picnic that we all love. But I'm not certain they can say that about a number of people on the hard left of the Democratic Party whom they might say, you know, that's just out of sync with my values and where the country is. I don't know if we've mentioned it yet, but Jamel Bowie is a UVA graduate. <laughs> uh, and he's chosen to live in Charlottesville. And I assume that you have seen him frequently, as we all have, on Face the Nation, which is hosted by, she's a UVA graduate, Margaret <laughs> Brennan. Uh, he does beautifully there. And Jamel, I want to get your perspective on this nominating process for the Democrats. Uh, this is strange. We were at the Beto O'Rourke visit <laughs> here in Charlottesville, and it, I, enjoy, I had a wonderful 20 seconds with him. Uh, <laughs> and, and for him, that's a lot, because he's the most energetic person I've ever met. Uh, how do you put this together? Do you think somebody like Beto can come back? Is it right. too late? I, mean, I think it might be too late. Part of the problem is that Biden, Biden is, because he's popular with so much of the Democratic Party, and because he's, he's sweeping up all kinds of constituencies. So if you are Elizabeth Warren and you're kind of banking on sort of like, not quite a Bernie-esque coalition, but something like it, Biden sucks up some of the most liberal voters too. If you're Bernie, whose coalition in 2016 was both the most liberal Democrats, sort of like very left-leaning people who were sort of A in the Democratic Party, and then actually a lot of moderate conservative Democrats, Biden's taking those moderate conservative Democrats. If you are in any kind of position within the party you're trying to take, Biden is taking a substantial chunk of those voters. And so I don't know, like in the absence of some other factor that would help O'Rourke break out or help Warren break out or help Harris break out or even Bernie for that matter, it's sort of, it's hard to figure out who has a path. It's gonna, I think, depend really on how Biden performs over the course of the year. And if he sees a sudden collapse, then all of those voters start suddenly become up for grabs. And in that situation, Harris appears to be a lot of voters' second place choice. Warren appears to be a lot of voters' second or third place choice. And so if I were kind of ranking the candidates, those are the two I think actually have a lot to gain from uh, Biden declining. Bernie too, to a similar extent, but he has his kind of like hard base and I don't know how much he can grow it, but it certainly won't shrink. A thing I think is worth thinking about in all of this is that although we don't have a lot of precedents for you know, two dozen candidates running for a nomination, we do have the past two years, 2017, 2018 cycles, which have a lot of dynamics that can, can I think help us understand what might happen over the next 18 months or so. So for example, candidates who won surprising races or large margins in kind of either conservative electorates or uh, very representative electorates are uh, Doug Jones in, in, in Alabama, um, who ran against a extremely controversial and conservative Republican with lots of scandals, and who was not particularly liberal, um, not conservative, but sort of like a moderate <coughs> liberal Democrat, um, but who was able to build a coalition of college-educated whites African-Americans and Democratic stalwart voters in the state to win a narrow victory. That sounds very familiar, right? That sounds like something that could plausibly happen. Here in Virginia in 2017, Ralph Northam, a traditional moderate Democrat, not really exciting very many people, but assembles a coalition of Democratic voters in the state, higher African-American turnout, higher Latino turnout, and then wins um, uh, traditionally Republican suburban areas like Chesterfield uh, County, um, when some in Northern Virginia. Again, a scenario that sounds plausible if you kind of expand it out nationally. And then in 2018, you have Democratic voters go for lots of moderate candidates and specifically lots of women candidates, lots of people of color. So you take all those things together and you actually can get a kind of sense of how these things might unfold. Biden, looking at those cycles, is actually the kind of candidate that did well in 2017, 2018. Harrison Warren, the kinds of candidates that did well in 2018. Um, beyond that, beyond sort of looking to those data points to kind of get into the minds of Democratic voters, 
I, you know, I have, I have no idea uh, <laughs> what else to say, right? Like, uh, at, at a certain point, it's all conjecture. I like to remember that at this point in 2015, uh, Jeb Bush was leading the Republican field. Uh, at this point in 2007, Hillary Clinton was leading the Democratic field. I mean, um, there are differences, clear differences, but it's also the case that, um, uh, who knows? Having said that, and I just had this thought. I my like, I have a ten month old, and my thinking process has become very shattered, uh, scattered lately. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> having said that, an interesting thing about Republic, the Republican primary in 2015, 2016, is similarly to how there are these underlying dynamics that could have helped you project where things were going. Trump ended up tapping in to uh, anxieties and angers that were present in 2013 and 2014. And so maybe something like that happens again this year, that whoever ends up becoming the nominee is someone who captures things happening just under the surface of the Democratic Party right now. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what that is, because right now, and this is before it starts and before they start attacking one another, and I wonder, will they all be attacking Biden, or are they going to divert and start attacking you know, the one that is in their way to get at Biden? Right. But uh, is... Are we ever going to move past, for the Democrats, the desire to beat Trump, which is very unusual for the Democratic Party? Uh, they, they say they want to win, but often it's, I'm going to vote for any Democrat except for A, B, C, and D. We've all heard that a million times, and then A gets the nomination, and, and they're busy on Election Day. Will that continue? It's one of the imponderables, as you right. say. Who knows? I, mean, I, I think that the desire to beat Trump will be overriding and I think I think Biden you know Biden may not be ideologically where the inner it may not be where the energy is ideologically in the Democratic Party but he gets that yeah all Democrats want is to get Trump out and he's tailored his message specifically to going after Trump one of the for me baffling things about the past six months or so of Democratic politics is that we know just from like observation from hearing what voters are saying that what is driving Democratic voters is we want to get rid of Trump. We want to hold Trump accountable. But Democratic leadership seems to be, their theory of the case seems to be, well, if we just put out policy, if we just sort of show how we'll govern, we'll get people to come with us. And I think Biden, interestingly, is quietly but very decisively rejecting where Nancy Pelosi's at, where Chuck Schumer's at, and saying, no, what voters, and what Democratic voters want is to beat Trump. And so I'm going to sell myself as a guy to beat Trump. Other Democrats who want a chance at winning the nomination need to not focus, not, need to not do what Republicans did in 2016 and go after the person next to them, but to look at Biden and say, no, Biden's actually not the most electable. Right. That's the only way you're going to beat him, right. by making the case plainly that I am more electable than he is. He is not electable for these reasons. But if the Democratic candidates don't do that, if they continue kind of to stay in their lanes, as the Republican candidates did in 2016, then I think Biden does just... He just wins it. Like, and it may end up being, you know, he wins a commanding percentage in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, and that's the ball game. Yeah. That's that is a great point, and we'll see whether that happens. Chris, we were just talking behind the behind stage, and and this is incredible because you're just too young. But he has attended, maybe as an infant, he has attended every Democratic convention since and including 1964 when Johnson was nominated for his uh, one elective term. Chris, you know the Democratic Party better than just about anybody. You've seen some of these dynamics before, but some are new. How do you evaluate it? Well, let me, let me start with what uh, you said a minute ago. Uh, I was at the 72 convention in Miami Beach, and uh, it was gonna be an uphill battle. McGovern had the nomination. He beat a guy who would have given Nixon a much better fight at Muskie. Uh, who was very cerebral, very mature, and he was, a, he was sort of a moderate Democrat, but he voted left on issues, but he seemed moderate. He was the perfect candidate to run against Nixon. Uh, I remember John Kenneth Galbraith, he's about eight feet tall. He was giddily celebrating the victory of McGovern with, with the Massachusetts delegation, which had duck, knocked out people like Tip O'Neill, just like the Chicago delegation knocked out Dick Daly. They were in a frenzy of happiness. They had won the battle that mattered which was knocking out the moderate Democrats. That was the one they wanted to win. It's called, we used to say about the new Democratic coalition, which was the new left, November doesn't count. 
There is a strain in the Democratic Party that is that way. Call what you want, but they really want to beat the middle and take over the party. They, they, they can lose the general, but what they really want, they don't want Biden to win the general, four more years or four years of a moderate Democrat. They want to beat the moderate Democrats. You got to understand that what drives them politically, beat the grown-ups, I think. Now, I, when I try to figure out an election, I try to go back, I try to read the paper on Wednesday, Wednesday day after the election. I try to read the lead. And what is most credible to me as the lead? And then I can figure out backwards who, would, who I think is gonna win. Now, we know when, Bush, uh, when, when uh, Trump won, it was gonna be exploiting certain things about the Democratic Party. Hatred of Hillary, which was an undercurrent, and helped along by Jim Comey and what he did 11 days out. But the questions, if you will, about Hillary was a big opportunity in the suburbs and place we never thought was gonna be there. Because Hillary had a pretty good reputation, but there was a lot of negativity about her. So here's what I think is gonna happen. I think it'd be a surprise if Trump gets reelected. I think we'll all be surprised. And the reason is because only less than 40% of the country say they like him. So that means every time we poll, three-fifths of the country say they don't like him. They like somebody else, anybody else. So that means Trump has to run a negative campaign. He has to find vulnerabilities. Now, historically, the Republican Party, going back to, uh, uh, well, the late 40s, understood a key trick to beating Democrats. Recognize that the voters capable of only thinking of three things when they go into the voting booth, maximum. They maxed out with three thoughts. Make sure all three of those thoughts are about your opponent and all are negative. So you watch what they did in the early 50s. It was communism, corruption in Korea. That worked, you got Eichen big time. They did it against Dukakis. It was the uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance with the teachers. He wouldn't find them for not leading their class in the Pledge of Allegiance. It was Willie Horton. Uh, it was the ACLU, that's big three. So what are the big three now? Trump's already trumpeting them now. The big three he's gonna use to win Pennsylvania again. And it may not work, because if he gets Biden against him, it won't work. But if he runs, a, a lefty runs against him, it will be the following three. Open borders. I just pulled up in, in uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I said, do you trust the Democrats to stop illegal immigration or even slow it down? No, nobody trusts the Democrats on, on illegal immigration. Late-term abortion. I personally have always been pro Roe. Leave it alone if I were the Democratic candidate. Leave it alone the way it is. Lay it, play it as it lays. Don't change it, don't go for late term changes because late term abortion is already an issue that Trump's playing on. He's being dishonest about it, the way he describes the, the procedure, but he's playing it. And third is socialism. You take those big three, that's a trifecta if you're running against the lefty. People do want something done about uh, uh, illegal immigration. They don't, they're not comfortable with late-term abor abortion, and they hate the word socialism. Going back to the Cold War, it is a bad word politically. It just is. Maybe a 25-year-old kid who's got student debt has a different view of it. They're, they're debtors, they're not creditors. They don't like capitalism, fine, but they're the rarity. So you take the big three, and then you throw in Bernie's support for prisoners voting. Are you crazy? And then Kamala comes along and says, I, I think that's something that should be in the conversation. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be in the conversation. <laughs> uh, certainly, when people have paid their debt to society, they should be able to re rejoin society. And I would give them an incentive to come back and decide, you get to vote. You're out, you're a citizen, you're back home. Be one of us, be a citizen. But while you're in prison, in stir, for any cost, God knows, crap, Bernie didn't limit it. Everybody, we have the Willie Horton Democratic Club. Yeah. I'm serious, it's, a, it's an absurdity. These people are not politically understanding the general election voters. So my question is, is Trump gonna be able to run a negative campaign against whoever the Democrats run? Now there's, I watched the nomination fight so far, and it's been, I, I always listen to Amy, Amy always knows what's going on. I just, a couple things. It's, I've been watching the NBA playoffs. I don't know, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It's the greatest sports I've ever seen, especially uh, the Warriors. And um, so basically there's two conferences. Biden has already won the moderate conference because he got buys from the following. Mike Bloomberg didn't run, who would have gotten a lot of moderate votes, a very smart guy. Uh, Terry McAuliffe didn't run. He, he's gonna support uh, uh, Biden, I think. Who else didn't run? Sherrod Brown didn't run. It's all these people that would have taken big chunks out of that 35% that Biden has gotten didn't run. On the left side, if you will, I checked the Quinnipiac poll last night coming up here, coming down here. 
It's very interesting, the Quinnipiac poll, because it shows that on the hard left, people are describing themselves as very liberal. Guess who's winning? Elizabeth's winning. Yeah. Elizabeth Warren is beating Bernie on the hard left. It's so interesting. She's really making a run of it lately among the people who really are committed progressives. So it's interesting. I, I, Kamala has made mistakes, as she did with, the, I think, the, uh, the prison voting thing. But I think that's an interesting fight. So the conference titles are, Biden's won his conference. The left fight is still hot. When will they turn their attention on the, the big fight? Now, it's all going to start next month, MSNBC, NBC debate, two different nights, Wednesday and Thursday night. You're going to have 10 candidates each night. We're going to, I, mean, I got the spin room, which I can't wait for, because <laughs> I get to get the wounded coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I can shoot the wounded or give them a chance to fix their wagon, you know, because everybody comes out of those debates with one goal exploit the victory or fix the, their people are yelling at what did you do in there and they had to fix that problem in the hour afterwards so that's going to be the bidding in a big fight will they will it be like Gulliver's travels with 20 or 30 democrats holding down holding down biden <laughs> is that is that what it's going to look like yes they're going to try to start the championship fight with with biden but so far biden's done everything right carl so right amazing rollout i was up in philly this weekend his big Weapon, it's astounding weapon. Came out of nowhere, Dr. Jill Biden. Wait till you watch her. She is something. She gave a patriotic, uh, it was a produced piece. I think Anita Dunn did it. A produced piece, which was so beautifully, obviously she's an attractive person, but a beautiful patriotic case where we gotta save our country from Trump and my husband's gonna do it. It was powerful. And I'll tell you, if, he can, if she gets out there and campaigns for him, it's going to be a good, uh, quite a fight. He's going to go to every county in Iowa. I'm sure she'll be there too. I think that is going to be the fight. I think Iowa, this thing could start right at the beginning. Chris, you made a lot of good points. You made one mistake. You, you didn't talk about NCAA basketball. That's big here. <laughs> We're all going to be rooting for the Pelicans pander. next year. Is that, like, uh, no, I do. I do want. I always do it this way. I root for UNC. Uh, <laughs> you lost the crowd, Chris. Steve Smith, come, come on. Uh, I uh, and then I root for the uh, other ACC team. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was not an acceptable answer. So. <laughs> We'll, we'll move, you would have lost the Democratic debate had you been in it and said that. What the hell was he thinking? Yeah, I know. <laughs> For God's sake, get this guy on Matthews right away. But you all remember I, I came out for UNC. See, that's the difference. Yeah, no, we Everybody get Everybody else is pandering here. Yeah. Good. I mean, this is, this is yeah. ridiculous good, for this good, guy. Next good, lot of good that did you hear, pandering. man. I mean, really, stop digging, stop digging. All right, before we run out of time, <laughs> Uh, I want to switch to the other side uh, to balance it off. And we haven't resolved anything about the Democrats, but then you didn't really expect that, did you? Uh, hope not. Now, on the, on the Republican side, Chris, you just mentioned the, the Q poll, Quinnipiac poll. And I hate to focus on one poll. You're supposed to do polling averages, and I, I want to apologize to, you know, Nate Silver and anybody else who's upset. But uh, what fascinated me about that poll and lots of others is that you have a golden economy, no question about it. People are, people even rate Trump positively on the economy. Not by much, you know, it's not a majority. But by a few points, they, they rate his performance positively on the economy. The economy itself, incredibly, 71% say it is excellent or good. It's the largest percentage in a long, long time. And yet, Trump's popularity in the poll, job approval, was 38 percent there has ne <laughs> there there has never been in the history of polling such a gap between positive evaluation of the economy and unpopular evaluation of the president so the question i have for you we know those numbers will change and we know that the trump base will turn out at an incredible rate and if the democrats reunite they'll turn out at an incredible rate i think we'll have the highest turnout in modern American history in, in 2020. But uh, we know the numbers will change, but it's pretty clear that Trump is stuck somewhere between the upper 
30s and the mid 40s, depending on which polling average you use and which polls you believe and all the rest of it. He got 46% in 2016. And he's almost never higher than that in any poll, much less the polling averages. Can he change that? Does he need to change that? Because there'll be third party candidates, Justin Amash is a libertarian, maybe. Uh, Howard Schultz, is he still living? I don't know what happened uh, to him, but I, maybe he went back to Starbucks, I don't know. Uh, but does he, does he need to change it? And if he does, how can he change it as such an extreme polarizer? Amy? $2 trillion in advertising. I think he will uh, be able to remember Morning in America. Is your name Amy? He let him go. Let him go. <laughs> you um, began your soliloquy by mentioning me. And by the time you got to the end of your soliloquy, you mentioned Amy. I'm sorry, I can't keep up. <laughs> Anyway, I think the advertising, uh, Reagan used Morning in America, all of a sudden it worked. And I think with a 7% unemployment rate with Reagan at the time, I think a good advertising campaign will identify him with the economy. Just thought. Yeah, no, no, that, but I don't think he'll do it with, with, by attaching himself to the economy because I think that's already baked into. There are people who say, I think the economy is doing great and I'm still not voting for him, right? We saw that in 2018. The, most educated, most well-off suburbs in America voted overwhelmingly for Democrats, many of whom have been embracing topics that normally they wouldn't support, right? Um, but with the number two that really strikes me is the percent of the voters who say at this point in the election that they definitely would not vote for Donald Trump, which is somewhere in the 50s. I, I was reading something today, CNN looked back at all other presidents running for re-election. Nobody's come anywhere close to that number. You know, with George W. Bush, it was somewhere in the 30s, Obama was somewhere in the 30s, right? Good, you know that you have that loyal opposition, you're never gonna get them, just keep them over there, that intensity. That's, and the other thing about this president, for all the talk about he has his base, and the other side has their anger in that base, the intensity on the strong disapproval has always been more intense than the strong approval. The challenge for Democrats, of course, is where that strong disapproval advantage is, right? It's not necessarily in the states that determine the electoral college. So while it may be incredibly strong in California or New York, it's not as, he needs it to be, or the Democratic nominee needs it to be as strong um, in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and uh, et cetera. I do think you're right. The only way for him to win, I do not believe that he gets anywhere close to 50%. Um, there is nothing he can do that's going to change these numbers. The only thing that would happen would be that the outside events change those numbers. Even then, I don't know what could actually work to see him move in within this range. And that range, by the way, Larry, also includes his floor, right? That he's not gonna be at 25% going into this election either. So that narrow range, somewhere between, as you said, 39 and 43 percent, is it enough to be at 43, 44 um, percent? Only if there is a third party candidate and that, as Chris pointed out, the negative advertising is so intense that what it does is depresses the turnout on the Democratic side or, in the, or more importantly, among those independent voters. We know that in 2016, the key group of voters were the folks who said, I hate Hillary Clinton and I hate Donald Trump and I don't know who I'm gonna vote for. And they weren't undecided because they hadn't been paying attention to the election. They absolutely had been paying attention to the election and they hated what they had to choose between. And ultimately those voters broke disproportionately for Trump. So that's what he has to ha hope happens again. But I guess the question for this panel would be, does anyone here think that Donald Trump wins the popular vote? Yes. And I don't, I don't know how he does. Well, we learned something from 2016, and that is that I California know, but, alone uh, is going to give the Democrat a two-point lead in the popular vote, and that plus five dollars will get you a small Starbucks, right? I mean, it just doesn't matter as long as we have the electoral college, which will be in existence. But it will matter, I think, all psychologically. Uh, psych yeah, psychologically. Psychologically, it will. But you know, hasn't hurt Trump. In the first term, particularly, I mean, Republicans haven't split off from him at all because he lost the popular vote. Jamel? But I think it, does, I think it has mattered. I think if 
Trump had won the popular vote and, can, and nothing else changed. He won the popular vote and was governed as he has. He'd be in a better political position. He lost the popular vote, and I think had he governed in the somewhat heterodox manner that was suggested by his campaign, right? Sort of supportive of the social, social safety net, supportive of big spending projects, somewhat moderate on social issues, not hard right on LGBT rights, not hard right on abortion. I mean, you look at, you look at what modern independent voters thought about Trump in the lead up, and while they did not like him, they did not also think of him as being a strongly conservative Republican. And I think his substantive weakness, beyond everything else, is that he is governed as a very conservative Republican. And so there is, there is potentially a crop of voters whose expectation was Trump would be kind of moderate. And the reality has been Trump has not been kind of moderate. And that is, it's possible, I think, to triage that and turn that into vote for Democrats because your expectations were yeah. dashed. I'll add uh, as well, as far as just sort of Trump's ability to, to win, um, if he was able to just stop tweeting, just like if someone took his phone, put it in the water, he doesn't have, a, I don't think he has a new phone, which are a bit water resistant, so just like throw his older phone in the water and stop, stop tweeting, just do traditional president stuff for not even 2019, for like June to October, that's it. <laughs> for June of October, just like shut the hell up. <laughs> he would win re-election. Yeah. I, I, I have no doubt he would win re-election in those circumstances. But because what's driving so much of politics is an intense dislike of Donald Trump, the only thing Democrats have to do to win is make sure they hold on to all anti-Trump voters. And in 2018, Democratic candidates generally won around 90% yep. of all anti-Trump voters. Yep. In 2016, it was like 85%. Yep. And that is, that is kind of the, the crux. If yep. Whoever they nominate, whatever they run on, whatever anything else, if they can hold on to 90%, 90%. of people yep. who don't like Trump, they've won that election. Yep. And if, that, if it dips below that, I think they're done. Yep. Yeah. Carl. You've got to be careful about extrapolating too much from 2018, though. Yeah, uh, yeah, first of all, they, they had centrist candidates in 31 districts that the Democrats flipped from, re, from Republican to Democrat. And second of all, it wasn't just all anti-Trump. Part of that vote was, I want to send a message to Trump. Right. Republican governor of Texas carries both congressional districts in Texas that flipped from D to R. And it was because Republic, suburban Republicans said, I, I don't like the president's tweets. I don't like his boorish behavior. I don't like how he's conducting himself in office. And the one way I can send him a message is to vote Democrat for Congress. So gotta be careful about reading too much. I, I agree with Amy, he's got a two to one problem. The people who strongly f approve of his performances off, uh, in office are outnumbered two to, by, two to one by those who disapprove. Those who strongly approve of his reelection are outnumbered two to one by those who strongly disapprove of his reelection. And, and this all goes back to the, how he got there. 30 in the, in the final exit poll, 37% of the electorate said, I like Donald Trump, and I'm voting for him. I think he's got the experience, the temperament, the qualifications. He's an agent of change, and I'm voting for him. Well, laugh at him if you will, but you got to recognize there's a part of the American electorate that felt that way. But he won because 9% of the electorate said, I don't like him. I don't think he's qualified. I don't think he has the experience or the temperament. But by God, he's not her, and I'm voting for him. She would put her finger on it. One out of every roughly uh, just under one out of five, just over one out of six voters said, I don't think either one of these people is qualified to be president. And they voted for him. The question for him is, is he going to be the guy who is the acceptable change? And the only way to do that is if the Democrats nominate somebody whom he can depict as way out of the mainstream, free college, free tuition, you know, an elitist looking down their nose at middle America. There are lots of ways he can get reelected advertising on the economy, but he's not, he not gonna change. So, so but he, he can irradiate potentially a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren and say, really, you, you, you know, you, you, you don't like me, but I'm the devil you got. You really want that other devil that you don't, that you don't know? And uh, he can get reelected that way. And, and look, that's, it, He's doing, he's doing Obama 2012. Make rhetorical gestures towards unity. Think about the State of the Union address. We are all in this together. We've got to find common ground. Second, a little bit of new policy. In fact, he's doing more new policy 
than Obama did. Obama did DACA in the middle of the summer of 2012 when he was worried about Latino turnout. This guy's already said, well, I got my immigration plan. We're going to do infrastructure. But the main part of 2012 Obama was disqualify Mitt Romney as a plutocrat unworthy of your support and count on it. That's what Trump is going to do with the Democratic nominee, whoever it is. You know what else was interesting about 2012, and I, I think this was true in 2004 as well, is that um, the approval rating that voters had for President Bush, for President Obama, was higher than their approval rating for how they were handling the economy. And so the opponents of both men said, well, we're going to make it about the economy, right? People think he's not doing a good job on the economy. We'll make it about the economy. Of course, they vote on the economy. But it was the approval rating of the president that became the more important yes. factor, right, as the more important <clears throat> um, indicator of how people were going to vote. And that's why your point you made earlier about being underwater, which he has never been. I don't, we've never had a president who's never, forget about it, he's never hit 50. He has never been above water in his entire presidency. Including inaugural day, Including which he screwed inaugural up day. by Maybe complaining there's one about poll, the crowd. Right. There was one poll Carnage. where he was above water on inaugural day. I think it was like 48, 46. Yeah. But ever since then. But never 50. Not never, a day of his presidency. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm going to ask one more question of this incredibly good panel that we could talk to all day, but there's another panel coming in 14 minutes and 13 seconds. Uh, I'm going to get at least a couple of your questions, as I was told to do, so I assume you've been texting them, and there are a couple of students here, uh, apparently, who are filtering them, so if your question isn't asked, you need to blame them. I want them to identify themselves. So. Go ahead and text whatever questions you've got if you haven't. And here's my final question, panel, because we, we've covered, to a certain degree, the Democrats, to a certain degree, Trump. Uh, we do have to look at the mathematics of this, as we've discussed partly. It's easy enough to see how Trump could win re-election if there is one strong independent or several medium strong independents, green or libertarian or you know Howard Schultz or whatever it turns out to be. Uh, do you think, based on what you've seen so far, do you think there's a market for any of that? And if so, who, who of the people who've been mentioned or you think might run as an independent? Chris? Well, I don't like third party candidates. I don't like them at all. I don't like them by nature because they screw up people. They allow people to cheat a cheap way out. You know, I've, I've spent my life with people. I voted for John Anderson. Don't blame me. I do blame you. Uh, uh, can I just go back to your last question? Because I, I think Trump has got a plan. It is to, I know it's hopeless, isn't it? Uh, he knows he's never going to get past low 40s on a good day. If he, I agree with you completely, Jamal. Just shut up for a couple months. If, the, if they run a crazy lefty against you, just keep quiet for a couple months. You'll probably win by, by a, a, a omission. But he's going after the, he's, you watched him the other night in Pennsylvania, Montourville. He's trying to figure out where he is right now. He, did, he was not securing himself the other night. He, he figured he had it out with those three big things, the trifecta that he used against the Democrats. But then that doesn't seem to work because Biden's moving up. He can't hit him on abortion. He can't hit him on socialism. He can't hit him on abortion. He doesn't fit that mold. So he's trying to, so he's going after nicknames again. This Alfred E. Newman thing works with people that remember Mad Magazine, which is about half the country. But it's funny. It actually is funny. It's not negative. It's not nasty. It's not going after him for his orientation or anything like that. Alfred E. Newman's a pretty funny thing. There's sort of a similar look there. You know, so, I mean, he's very smart. The Pocahontas thing, you can say it's an ethnic slur. It's not really an ethnic slur. It's just a stupid thing to say, but it, it works with his crowd. And he's trying to find these out because he knows nobody's going to really like him in the majority. So he has to make the other person a joke. But I'll tell you, when they get on the stage together, guys, that's going to be great because whoever it is, woman, male, person of color or not, they're going to have to take him on physically. That's what's going to be fascinating. That's the chilling excitement of the next year's election. Because when they got up there, like Nixon and Kennedy, it all mattered that they were in the room together. Nixon could always beat Kennedy if they weren't in the room together, but he couldn't beat him in the room together. And so watch this. When this, he pulls his Godzilla number, like he did on Hillary, remember? When he comes walking behind her and looms over her. What's the candidate, male or female, whoever, what are they going to do? Because that's the moment. That's the sister soldier moment. That's when you show your guts. You got to turn around and make the guy look like an idiot. Well, and, and, I, and I think Chris? that's going to be the great thing in the election. This is going to be one great election. I'm telling you, watch MSNBC. <laughs> 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 I'm 
this is going to be one. That's it, Chris. Back to you, the Lester. end. Uh, <laughs> You did remind me, though, of the, the back in 2000 when Gore blew it. Remember getting oh, yeah. right in oh, George yeah. W. The Bush's sign. face. So it does matter what oh, happens. Yeah. Was on it the sign? It was the sign, and also he came up and tried to sort of get in Bush's face. Oh, right. Bush turned around and gave him the sort of, oh, he I see you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Al, Al, keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, what are you doing? Hi, how are you? It was brilliant. What All about right. Dingle uh, Norwood? That was his it's question. pretty what obvious. What about Dingle Norwood? He said to W. And what? W killed him. He, he said what? Him. He said, what about Dingle Norwood? That's what, yeah. that's what Gore said to Bush before Bush oh, destroyed oh, him. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody in here knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I do. Yeah. But now, you bet the all four talk. panelists have made it very clear they don't care about the question I asked. We have nine minutes left. Let's go to audience questions. Where are the students? Oh, very good. Come on up. And what? tell us your name and what your major again and so on. All right. Um, my name is Merritt Gibson. I'm a rising third year and I'm a history major. Um, and our first question is, should Democrats pursue impeachment and what effect would the process have on the 2020 election? Cancel the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody has quoted Shakespeare yet. He's the one who said it. To impeach or not to impeach, that is the question. I, I, yes or no? I, so I think it's impossible to say what the political impact is going to be. I think anyone who says definitively that it's going to help Trump or that it's going to hurt Trump doesn't, there's no way to anticipate, predict it because each impeachment is unique. Um, there's, no, there's no particular thing you can pull from it to make a generalized case. I will say that the logic of the Democratic argument points towards impeachment. That it is strange, as merely, it's just a matter of rhetoric to consistently say, you know, the president broke the law, the president's threatening the Constitution, the president X, Y, or Z, and then when someone asks, well, are you gonna do the thing that the Constitution empowers you to do in that case? And you say, I mean, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if, if Democrats sincerely believe the case they're making about Trump, I think the logic points towards impeachment. I think there's a way, I think it's possible that impeachment treated soberly, not as the Democratic majority going after Trump, but as the House of Representatives kind of holding the president accountable, uh, uh, can sort of set the stage for how the public understands the 2020 election. And I think that is the thing that Democrats are going to have to do regardless of what path they take with impeachment. And that is, how do they make sure that 2020 is fought on their terms and not Trump's? Yeah, look, uh, with Stephen Fried Chicken Cohen uh, downing the bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken and Jamie Raskin saying, let's take... Uh, administration officials who don't respond to our subpoenas and jail them in the basement of the Capitol. Anybody who thinks the Democrats have got a thoughtful, reasonable, persuasive way to move forward with this is kidding themselves. That they could do no greater favor to the president than to let loose with their inner demons. The picture I saw this weekend of Jerry Nadler with his belt up here somewhere about mid-belly. <laughs> You know, the, the, the image of the Democratic Party is not going to be a pleasant one if you unleash the House Judiciary Committee on impeachment. It's just not. And if, and, if, and, and if I were sitting in the West Wing, or I was sitting over there in Arlington in the Trump headquarters, I'd say, bring on fried chicken Cohen. Bring him on. They want it. They see this as his ticket to real life. You want know, it. I don't know, but, but, but if I were them, I'd say, the lunatics who are in charge of this process in the House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi is a tough, smart individual. There is a reason why she is saying the time is not now, the process is not ready, we, if we do this at our own peril. And she's got the experience to know. Uh, I think uh, we, we all don't have to comment on each question and we better go to the next one. Where's the next student? What's your name and I know you're Hi, my name is John. I'm a rising fourth year studying foreign affairs and history. Um, so our next question, uh, you've all discussed how low Trump's numbers are at the moment, but they were also low in 2016. How confident can we be in polling in 2020? Again, cancel the next. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Before going, in, we, we, could, we could literally spend an entire panel on this. I just think 
the thing to remember. bore the hell out of everybody. Yes, <laughs> about predictability. But I think in 2016, and quite frankly, with, with data in general, the challenge isn't that the, just getting the right data, it's how you interpret the data, right? And I think there were a lot of folks who looked at the polls who, if there were two other names on those ballots, would have had a different perception of the election than that it was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton next to each other, especially if you look, for example, at a state like Pennsylvania where the numbers were always very, very close. Yes, she was in the lead, but it was never by a significant margin, and the trend line was always, at least in the last week, in those three states was going the wrong way for her. But I think what really, that when I talk about interpretation, I think the biggest danger in 2020 is to do what we did in 2016 is focusing on those models that gave you a percentage, right? There's a 76% chance, there's an 84% chance, there's 96%. Human beings are not very good at understanding that kind of information. We know logically, if there's an 80% chance that Hillary Clinton's gonna lose, there's a 20% chance that she won't. But if there's an 80% chance that it's gonna rain, you're bringing your umbrella and you're gonna be really mad at the weather forecaster when it doesn't rain because you, you, know, you canceled all of your plans. So I don't think that the, I think that the polling was actually, there were a couple of states like Wisconsin where the polling was definitely off. But I think if we go and we assume that 2016 was a collapse at a terrible failure of polling, I think that is actually the wrong way to look at it. 2018, the polling was right on, the data analytics were right on. We had a very unique 2016 election, as we both have pointed out, between two very disliked people. We've never seen that before. People having to make a choice between two people they like or dislike equally. So I think the challenge this year is to not dismiss polling, to be skeptical for sure, to never buy into just one poll and to look at a trend line and to throw out these, well, there's a 75% chance or an 82% chance as the way to think about this election. And the political science models were very accurate, even right. in 2016. And, and, and but the authors, no. yeah, the authors of the models didn't believe the result yeah. that showed Trump either winning or in a tie with Hillary Clinton. They dismissed their own work. Yep. That was the problem yep. in 2016. Yeah. Yep. At least with, with political science. You know, what, I think yes, that Chris. Kellyanne called me the night before the election and asked, uh, how's it look? And I said, well, call, I think Riddell, I said, Riddell thinks three or something like that. They've got former governor. I think you're right. I, mean, I, I always look up to Amy about this. And I think when we say 2%, we say, oh, it's a solid 2%. Well, what's a solid 2%? Right. And, and a guessing game where we had just had the Comey report going after Hillary that last week. Uh, there was also something I picked up again, and I always knew this, but uh, I picked it up again this week up in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, people think that, that the establishment looks down on them. Now, just think about what that means to you. If you're a working, working class, regular person living in Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, or Erie, and uh, you think the big time elite, like us here, everybody, is a, think they're better than you, the Ivy Leaguers. Do you think you're gonna, you get a call from a very well uh, educated voice or pollster, are you gonna give them a straight answer? You're gonna tell them you're for the one that they look down on? You're gonna say, oh yeah, you're right to look down on me, I'm for Trump. No, why would you give them the straight answer? I think there's a tremendous resistance to talking to anybody that looks like the media. And, and the pollsters sound like the media. Somebody calls out from public opinion research or something. Oh, and you want my personal vote you want to know about? Screw you. So I, get the, I, I know this is not scientific, but I think people are very wary of the establishment. They don't like it. They don't like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, our networks, anybody. And, and you call them and say, I'm calling for them. Can you tell me how your innermost thoughts are in this campaign? And you're going to vote against it. No, that's just proof to me that you're a lowbrow. Thank you. And hang up. So I That's think why on, we're, we're transitioning, I think, to online polling and there are there are ways to do it correctly a lot of experiments are being done on it and there's less of that because it's you and the computer screen uh, you're not interacting with someone well, the from Harvard. Well, to ask, how are your friends voting? Aren't there some of those tricks you don't, I thought there's ways to sort of yes. filter it out. Get a, the, go around the question and yeah. say, how are your friends and family voting? Then you can blame it on them. You could admit what's really happening and blame it on them. Any, uh, any final comment? We have one full minute left. Let me ask all of you uh, to go ahead and declare the victor in November 2020. <laughs> one word, just one name. One name. The American people. <laughs> See, there we go.
go. Yes, oh, we always win, Carl. I, 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 we I, the people always win. I, I will say one thing yes. very quickly about this upcoming election, and that is that as we think about what might happen and how the public's going to choose, we should also remember that not every member of the public has equal access to the polls, not every member of the public has equal access to the ballot. And, and that is going to affect the outcome. We saw that in the last cycle election, just thought in 2016. Who can actually get the ballot will matter just as much as what people want to happen. But that's absolutely true, and it's the obligation of all of us to make sure that everyone who wants to vote gets to vote. Who's qualified? Look, we have had a wonderful time, but wait, I want to I wanna tell you something. You know it just from listening to them. These are four people to watch and listen to and read every word they write because that's how you're going to find out what's really going on in 2020. You all have been terrific. One of the best panels that I've ever moderated. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. I wish they'd given me a gavel. I'd like to gavel this session in. We're getting a little feedback. Is that coming from me? Let's hope not. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm John Dickerson of 60 Minutes and The Atlantic Magazine. I'm very glad to be with you again today. Thank you, and I'm very excited about this next discussion because I feel like it is the discussion at the heart of kind of all of the discussions we're having over the next, over these three days. It is technology in the new age of politics, or maybe it's politics in the new age of technology. In any event, it's, it's the new age. Political scientist and, and presidential historian Richard Neustadt, who, by the way, when you're talking about the presidency, you have to sometime come across Richard Neustadt. It's like when you're talking about democracy, you're gonna hear about de Tocqueville. So Richard Neustadt said the power of the presidency is to persuade. Now in the 60 years since he said that, those of us who think about the presidency have either been trying to wriggle out from under that definition of the office or we've been finding ways in which that still turns out to be true. And uh, we start on our panel today with two people who've had to wrestle with that question in, as practitioners. Uh, Don Baer was the director of communications in the Clinton White House. He is now chairman of Burston Marsteller. And Dan Bartlett uh, was counselor to the president in George W. Bush's administration. He's now executive vice president of corporate affairs for Walmart. And what they had to do was not only communicate in this technologically changing world in campaigns, but also in crises in presidential administrations. And then the really interesting thing I hope they'll talk about today, which is how to do the slow patient work of trying to change minds or build consensus in communication with the president on issues where the American people weren't, uh, where it wasn't a crisis. Um, so I can't wait to hear um, from then. We're also joined by Aisha Roscoe, who is on the other end of this. What's it like to be at a White House, covering the White House, in a, in a situation where there are news cycles embedded in news cycles? Um, Aisha covers the White House for NPR. Before that, she covered it. She covered the Obama administration for Reuters. And before that, she covered environmental issues uh, uh, as a policy reporter. And our moderator is Nicole Hemmer, who um, I've benefited from her work. She's an assistant professor of presidential studies at the Miller Center. Um, and she is also co-editor of the Washington Post history section uh, called Made by History. Uh, it's wonderful to get historians to write about current events that are taking place, so you get immediate doses of context, which in this day of technological shredding, uh, where we only learn things in tiny little bites, um, it's nice to have a little historical perspective. She's also a contributing editor at Vox and co-hosts the podcast Past Present. So with that, I now will shut up and leave it to Nicole. I hope you all enjoy. Well, I couldn't agree with John Moore about the importance of really digging into the way that covering the White House and communicating from the White House has changed pretty dramatically as media forms have changed in the past 30 or so years. And the historian in me wants to point out that we have folks from sort of a variety of different moments in that recent change from the 1990s, from the 2000s, from the 2010s. And so, if, you, if I can honor chronology and start at the beginning in a way. Um, <laughs> uh, with the 1990s. <laughs> and, and ask, you know, in your time, either in the White House or um, covering the White House, what have been the most significant changes in communicating from that building? Thank you for that easy question. Um, uh, and and uh, you know, one thing, I actually was a White House correspondent and that political reporter at U.S. News and World Report uh, uh, before going to the White House. And I first started as President Clinton's chief speechwriter 25 years ago. And then uh, 24 years ago, became the White House communications director. And who here remembers the name of a man named Herb Klein? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. 
So her, I, I got to thinking about this, because it's, uh, it's an honor to be here, but I got to thinking, Herb Klein was the very first White House Communications Director, person with that designated role and title. He did that job for President Nixon starting in 1969, did it through 1973. And I was thinking you know, about this panel, because it was 24 years ago that I became White House Communications Director, Asking me a question like that would have been like my bringing Herb Klein back to ask him those questions. So it's really <laughs> nice of you all to have me here. Um, I, um, the, the, the biggest changes really, I think, come under the category of the explosion of media outlets and, and opportunities for people to express their point of view and for reporters to, uh, and journalists of all sorts, and again, even the definition of what a journalist is, I think, has changed radically, uh, to just get out there and be out there in the constant sort of barrage of, of, of information that is coming at people. Um, when I started, in the White House, uh, we had one cable news network, which was called the Cable News Network, uh, <laughs> CNN. Um, uh, it wasn't until 1996 that something called MSNBC started, and people forget that the MS stood for Microsoft, because this was a joint partnership between Microsoft and NBC uh, that was meant to bring a whole new kind of, you know, computer age vibe uh, into uh, cable news. And it had a computer online component to it. I'm uh, privileged to be the very first person who ever did a live chat from the West Wing. Uh, because on the night that MSNBC launched, I, I always worked very late. I was the only person left around. And so they had <laughs> me do that live chat. Uh, uh, and of course, the, the uh, creation of Fox News, which came uh, a year or two later, uh, which had a, a very dramatic change, I think, uh, over time. And indeed, the fracturing of the American audience, of the American people, along lines of how they would sort of categorize themselves politically, socially, culturally, in what media they were absorbing. Um, and then there's just no way to, uh, to underestimate the impact of uh, social media and how that has radically changed everything. You know, we used to have a weekly radio address. You still did the weekly radio address, didn't you? Uh, that the president, because Ronald Reagan had started it, he had a great radio background, uh, that we did every Saturday morning. Um, and it was good for a few things. One, it was good to bring uh, friends, family, and donors in because they would be able to come into the Oval Office and watch the president do this live radio address and then get their pictures taken with them afterwards. And the other thing it was good for was a little bit of a sort of targeted message. And I always used to drive my family crazy because we changed the topic like four or five times in the Clinton White House on Friday night. So you're rewriting the speech for the next morning. We used to tape it on Friday afternoon. Of course you did. They were the <laughs> disciplined White House. But and then something would happen, we'd like have to scramble. That was our ability to target a message, right? To get something targeted. Well, that seems so quaint at this point because of what has happened with, with every form of social media. And of course, this administration, this, this president, uh, uh, and as a candidate uh, has mastered that form uh, in some ways that some of us would say are diabolical and others would say are remarkably effective. But in, either way, and of course we're seeing it across the board at this point, that's the biggest, most dramatic change. Mm -hmm. What about for you? Well, first of all, thanks for, for having me. It's a real pleasure. And I was just thinking as John Dickerson, uh, now that he's a fame at 60 Minutes, but before that he was a White House correspondent as well. And, and John, I remember, because people always say, he's like, what'd you do for President Bush? I was like, I was communication director. I'm kind of like, oh, sorry <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> that must have been challenging. And I remember uh, John particularly asked a, a pretty pointed question in a primetime press conference in the East Room of the White House. And, um, and he was always clever about the way he, he could get it to where he wanted to get a certain answer, or at least to make a, the president squirm. And, this was a particularly effective one in which the president was yammering over and over, and then finally it was just like dead air time. I was like, just say something and all this. It was like, it was a, a really rough 15 to 20 seconds. And after the press conference, we we're walking in the east, back up to the residence, and yeah, I kind of like looked at him like, I kind of got stuck in a rhetorical cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> we had a few of those along the way. Um, <laughs> So, uh, no, but it's interesting. I was thinking about just, everybody kind of says, well, in my time, listen, we obviously spent a lot of time thinking about and studying the, the Clinton White House and how they did things. And 
One of the things that we noticed was that early on in the Clinton administration, they were really good about drafting off the news of the day. They were very, and, and it was, the, the president was always in the news on the news, almost kind of likened it to stock trading. They were kind of like day traders. Mm -hmm. And we turned out to be the cool opposite. We were like long-term investors. So we had our three things we always wanted to talk about. And, it, and oftentimes for them, I think it, it was hard for them to get message discipline and have messages punched through. And ours was the opposite. It was like sometimes we could be discordant with what's going on in the media because, no, if it's not education or this or that, we're not going to talk about it. And obviously they recalibrate, we recalibrate. But probably one of the bigger things, and it's going to sound funny now that happened while we were there, was he had to deal with cable television. We had to deal with the blogosphere. And, and particularly, a particular moment was in, uh, in 2006 when... Uh, a sitting Republican president tried to do comprehensive immigration reform, and the debate was being waged uh, mostly on the center right, on our own party, and we were losing ground from our own party. And most of that debate, we were trying to have that debate on television and on the, at the press podium and things like that, and the debate was being won or lost in the blogosphere. And it's interesting to think, I mean, you always think of the White House and those who, the practitioners of it, would be on the cutting edge of communications technology, which you know, is more so the case, I think, on campaigns. But the institution of the White House is incredibly risk averse, and, and they have a lot of lawyers to protect <laughs> that. And Don and I probably spent more time with lawyers in the White House trying to do things. And so I was, uh, I, we were kind of insistent that we had to have a White House blog. That sounds so obvious and practical in, the, in, the, in hindsight, but at the time, I mean, it was, meeting after meeting after meeting. And I had two people who were on my team, they were kind of hybrid communicators, policy people, who were gonna be the designated bloggers. And you know, they, they had, like I said, policy background and those things in communications. But they, the, the lawyers and everybody just couldn't get themselves comfortable with what if they make a mistake, what if, the, what if, what if, what if. And they finally came in with a, they thought was a big concession to say, we'll let you cut and paste the approved talking points from the press for the press secretary and put them in the blog. Like, makes really good reading. Yeah, it makes it. So we're like, I might as well not do it at all. And so I used my privilege of being assistant to the president and having a long relationship with the president. And I took the two bloggers. We walked into the Oval Office and I said, Mr. President, I need your permission to, to allow these two people to make mistakes on your behalf. And he's like, what the heck are you talking about? And I'm like, so I explained to him the whole debate. And I said, look, they're going to probably not get it all right. And they're, you know, and, and he said, fine, fire away, whatever. So we walk out and I kind of wave at the lawyers as we walk by. And <laughs> un <laughs> unfortunately, we, we joined the debate too late. So it was obviously, but just, it's, it's just interesting when you fast forward to now. And I think one of the skill sets and capabilities that Don and I face in our current jobs, but not as much then is, the practitioners of our trade, and particularly on those teams, are so much first in video and in mobile and, and those things. And so the, the evolution to mobile, the evolution to video, and obviously there's no such thing as really a news cycle anymore. It's just continuous. Um, and obviously we can get into the, the communications habit of the current president, but, uh, and risk averseness has clearly gone out the window in that institution now for that perspective, but it's, um, it, but the risk averseness, the institutional bias that it has to be is to protect not just the, we think about it more to protect the president, it is more about protecting the presidency. And so that's something you have to navigate as you're trying to do your job of communicating to the American people. I have to say, Aisha, hearing all this talk of blogs reminds <laughs> me how much things have changed in just the 10 years that you've been a journalist. Yeah, I, I think that what, what stood out to me just listening to you guys talk, uh, even talking about that radio address, which then I remember President Obama made it into like a YouTube address to make it a little bit. And President Trump kept that up for a little while and then that stopped. Uh, and, and so it's just an example of how, but that was a way at a certain point to drive a message. Mm -hmm. You would pick that message for the week and that's what you kind of wanted people to be talking about over the weekend and people to pick up, pick up on it. And there were stories that were done off of those, but it just quickly became uh, uh, something extraneous in a time where you can just hear from the president at any moment on your phone. <laughs> and so I, I would say that there's been kind of this momentum, and you do have to do this kind of dividing line at the Trump administration because he's kind of taking it to another place. But 
even during the Obama administration, I remember during the Bush administration, you would hear this idea wanting to get around the media, wanting to find your own way to get the message out. And so presidents were doing this, and Obama would do this. Talk radio. Yeah, to talk radio, you would go to, Obama would talk to certain YouTube bloggers or whatever, and get a lot of press off of that, and it was a way of getting your message out, but not talking to the New York Times or anyone like that. So you, you kind of saw this progression and then you got to the Trump administration, the current administration, and pretty much there was a decision at some point that we're going to go completely around the media <laughs> and we're just going, you know, President Trump is just going to be Trump and he is going to talk to the people directly through Twitter and just at these kind of impromptu press conferences. And so there has been this big change. And even for me, I think Twitter has been the biggest thing for me. I was never a big tweeter. You know, I'm like, why do I want to talk about what I had for breakfast? Like that, because that's what it used to be, right? Like, why are we tweeting about what you had for lunch? But then it became this thing where you had to be on Twitter to know what was going on. And even now, like, my boss will sometimes be like, are you monitoring this event? I'm like, yeah, I got Twitter up. I got it. <laughs> and so you, I mean, but if anything big happens, you will see tweets before you see anything else, really. Like, you, you will get a tweet before you get a news alert. You, you will see the tweet first, and then you'll see what's kind of bubbling up to the surface and what's really getting a lot of attention. And that has pluses and minuses, but that's kind of the way things have gone. And I think what you've seen with President Trump, when he came into office, he took Twitter and decided, now we're going to be issuing official statements from this. We're going to be issuing decisions about transgender people in the military. We are going to be making statements to Iran in all caps, saying never threaten us again. So you never know. And I mean, I, as a journalist, and I don't know any other journalist who isn't like this, you have your phone on the side of the bed. If you're covering this White House, you have the alerts for Trump. I hear them, 6 in the morning, my phone's going off. There was a time recently where my phone was going off like 40 times. I'm like, what is going on? And he was just retweeting all those things about Joe Biden and firefighters are really with him and not Joe Biden. But he retweeted like 40 times. And so this is happening at like 6 in the morning. Well, it's like he was sitting on the phone, right? Yeah, it was just like, hey, but, you're, but the thing is, you're afraid to like cut off the alerts because you're like, well, he might, in the, in the midst of those retweets, there might be something important. But I did sleep through most of that. But that's, I mean, that's what you're dealing with at this point. That's how much things have changed. Right, you're talking about a, a real disruption in the lines of communication from the White House to the public. We've talked about the ending of the, the radio broadcast, but also there used to be at the end of the night a full lid that came on and that meant no more news. <laughs> Um, there used to be White House press conferences. Um, there used to be briefings. And briefings. Daily. Now they're like quarterly or <laughs> elsewhere. So what's the consequence of losing those things? I, you know, I, I think that there is a big loss by losing the daily briefing. People will have different views on kind of the effectiveness of the daily briefing as a journalist and its importance because they will, you know, say this is a time where maybe they felt like journalists were grandstanding. I'm sure you guys never felt no. that way. Um, and there are time, and it's a time where you know the White House is getting their message out, so people may feel like they're not being challenged enough, and you're just kind of giving them this platform. But I think that what the daily briefing did offer was a time where you could ask questions about a broad variety of topics, not just even necessarily the news of the day, and you could dig in on certain topics. And you could press the, the White House for answers. And I think that also forced a White House to have to come up with answers and to kind of have one voice speaking. And I do think that with this administration, you see kind of the effects where you have, you know, you'll have Sarah Sanders saying one thing, you'll have another press person saying another, you have the president saying another thing, you'll have, there's not one voice. You're not hearing like one message that they're really just kind of hammering on other than what the president goes with, which is like no collusion, no obstruction. But you don't have, but there's more going on than that, right? That they could be driving home a message. You don't even hear an economic message necessarily, not one. And that you can just go back to over and over again or look at this chart with the Obama administration. They pull out these charts and you'd be like, ah, 
You see, and as a journalist, you're like, I've seen this 80 times, but they were getting that message across, and you, you don't have that. So our, our friend Mike Allen at Axios always says, but, 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 right? So there's the b big but on this, which is that um, what hasn't changed, what really is constant, is that every White House, every president, every presidency <laughs> wants to figure out how to lead the country, some would say control the message, control the conversation, uh, towards the direction that is in the better interest of them politically, and one hopes what they view the better interest of the country is. Um, and it's different now because there are so many other inputs and tools and the like, but what we lose sight of, I guess, is what I always call the meta message, right? What, what, what's the big theme? What's the big idea? And it doesn't have to be about a policy. It's really more about a, a, a conception and a sense of what the theory of the case is uh, for what that president is all about and is trying to get done. And some are better at it than others. I think, Dan, you're right. When all you're doing is playing off the daily news, and this was a challenge for the Clinton presidency in the first two or three years, you're just sort of being swung around by the wind. Um, on the other hand, as you say, you can go too far in the other direction. Um, one could argue that, uh, that Trump is actually, for what he's trying to accomplish, doing a pretty darn good job of it. He's keeping a lot of other people off guard. Mm -hmm. uh, the economic news is not lost on anyone, but he doesn't have to talk about it because it's out there and every, all of you are, are talking about it and people are seeing it and experiencing it. And of course, we understand that it's not necessarily spread far and wide and really sort of benefiting everyone, and that's one of the challenges. But he's also, his message is, I'm not taking anything off of anyone. Right, and I'm going to always sort of defend myself. And there's a segment of his supporters who actually like that about him. And so that's part of his meta message that he's driving, using whatever tools are available to him, constantly. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, all of us were trying to reach our, our supporters, but reach the public in general, and, and trying to do that in a way that was consistent in the sense that if you are articulating the objectives in which and the, the policy goals and the, and the outcomes you push during the election, obviously in some case was endorsed by the election and then you're trying to articulate those throughout, that that would benefit the country but also benefit you politically. And, and that at times got exacerbated when what, how do you do that during a national crisis? So I was there during 9-11 and dealing with that. And then the question is what is the role between the media and government during a national crisis? And and the, the public, uh, the, the, the obligation we have, both of us, both institutions, to inform the public. And then as that played out, and then it went from just the days and weeks after 9-11 into obviously uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and those things, and there was a lot of scrutiny about did the media do their job, per se, with regards to being the, the scrutiny. We all thought about it as that there was not really ever an option not to engage the mainstream media or the White House correspondents. But we were always, it was always an and strategy. It was trying to find our constituents and, and, our, and our voters and those things through talk radio or through uh, targeted media, regional media or local media or these things in particular states. But it was never an either or proposition. But technology has changed and the fact that he can reach 100 million people at any given moment is an incredible tool to utilize. What's odd about it is the situation that he's done, he's jettisoned all the traditional aspects of engaging the media. He's totally preoccupied about what they're saying about him, though. He has, a, he has an intense infatuation with the New York Times and with the networks and what they're doing. And it's a love-hate relationship in a weird way. But I can't disagree that, and I think this will probably whipsaw back under whatever next president, whether it's after two terms or another, we can get into that. But my sense is, is that whoever comes in on the backside of that is going to restore, maybe not all of it, but I think you're going to see more daily briefings and, and those things and some of the, it'll, it'll evolve with the way uh, communications evolve, but I think you'll see a, a course correction of it. I think he's pretty unique, but the, the undisciplined nature of the tweets is one thing, but using Twitter as an effective communication tool has been really brilliant on his part. I, I will say that his if you talk to his campaign, uh, they are very happy with the way that President Trump is able 
to kind of insert himself into any national dialogue. I mean, one thing that they mentioned was the Kentucky Dirt, the Kentucky Derby thing, where he tweeted about that, and then after that, every Kentucky. Kentucky Derby story had lines about President Trump. So he was in that story. So for them, they're very happy about that, that he's kind of like omnipresent and that he can just kind of insert himself into pop culture or whatever is going on and get that coverage. Yeah, and you think about it now on the previous panel, we're in the 2020 elections, the Democratic primary election cycle. It's unheard of for an incumbent president. I mean, it was always wait as long as you have, you can possibly wait before you have to become one of those lowly candidates again. You are the president. You don't even give them the time of day to, to give your opinion about that. I'm running the country. That's always been the playbook, running as an incumbent in the White House. But he's changing that, and it's pretty interesting because it is the most critical. I always feel like this phase of the campaign, which is called the definitional phase of a campaign, is usually the most critical because whoever candidate sets the terms of the debate, they usually set them that are favorable to their own background and characteristics and policies. They're the ones who ultimately typically win. And so inserting himself into this critical phase of the definitional phase of this campaign gives him a hand up in a way that you can say it's untoward, you could say it's not presidential, but I bet it's effective. It's probably effective and I think that there is something about these structures we've been talking about that can be seen as barriers between the public and their government. And one of the things about these new technologies that we're talking about is that one of their core promises when they're introduced, whether it's C-SPAN or cable news or social media, is that they are supposed to make government more transparent. Has that worked? And if it has, why? And if it hasn't, why hasn't it worked to make government more transparent? Well, I said I covered a White House. I covered the uh, George H.W. Bush White House. Um, and then I worked in the White House. And it always shocked me, once I got inside a White House, how little we in the press actually knew about what was going on in the White House. Um, because, and I mean, this is true across the modern presidency, if not the entire history of the presidency, there's the desire to erect an artifice uh, so that the media sort of see one part of things and you eat sometimes they even bring you in and they'll tell you some stuff, but you know, trust me, all of that has been canned and, and, and pre-produced for you to know. And then what's really going on behind the scenes? Of course, even when you're in the middle of it, uh, because it's refracted through so many different points of views and realities and you know, rooms where it happens that you weren't in that room for the whole time, or you even were in the room and you still didn't know what was going on, which happened to me all the time. And uh, <laughs> I, you know, it, it, transparency um, is an artifice. And I, it, it, the truth is, with all of this profusion of, of access, as it were, it's harder to get a good sense of what reality is and what's really going on rather than easier. And it's not like we have a lot of whistleblowers, you know, inside administrations who are sending anonymous tweets out about, oh my God, this happened at HUD today. Um, we're not getting that. So it, it, it is, I mean, I hate to say it, it's the manipulation of a reality that, um, that you want people to perceive. You know, and this is kind of a, maybe not on the transparency part, but if you think about it from the sense of, I guess when Ronald Reagan was reelected in 84, 82% of the public got their news from CBS, ABC, and NBC. And by the time y'all got there, that was probably almost cut in half and, and on and on. And so you sit there and look at that and say, okay, there's not a monopoly on information. There's no longer a monopoly that the proliferation of technology and access to information, in theory, should be a good thing more sources of information, more access to information should make a more informed public. But I think we all have seen what has happened exactly. We've actually made it more efficient to be, to go to sources of information that reinforce your views, not question your views. And so we all go to our favorite, um, you know, app or this or that and we get, and, and so it's balkanized on, on political lines and ideological lines in a way that hasn't helped. And so if you're in the White House and you're trying to reflect that reality or understand that that is the reality, you almost, you're almost forced to play that game and to go to those platforms that are gonna reinforce your, your political support. So 
Um, it has been, uh, it hasn't been the tonic we thought it would be on a more informed public, that's for sure. Well, and of course, there's also, as we know, and has become a major social problem, um, the ability to actually manipulate in these new platforms what looks like reality. So, I mean, the issues with regard to video and, and uh, manufactured video and uh, everything that we know now about uh, the Russians and what, has, what happened during the 2016 election, which is already projected to be even worse than the 2020 election without defense. Um, um, these, you know, it, 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 so actually being a citizen, being an informed citizen, has become a whole lot harder. And that is one of the great, great challenges of the age that we're in. You do wish, and I don't mean this as a partisan statement, that we had national leadership that appreciated that difficulty and understood that at the end of the day, the, the fundamental, irreducible, most essential element of a democracy working is for a citizenry that is at least striving to be informed. And that national leadership was trying to have a conversation with the country um, in order to kind of help us move through this big, big time of transformation that we're in in a, in a more effective way. I do think we don't have that right yeah. now. Your earlier comment about what the reality we're portraying is different than the reality inside the White House. I think actually maybe with Trump, we actually we're for, <laughs> getting we're seeing, It is pretty. I think what we we're being told is actually how it is, and, that, and knowing some of the dynamics inside. Everybody's talking about everything. But that's because he that's because he ticks off so many people. Yeah. Also, right. Exactly. So the, there. there there is a dynamic with this White House where obviously you've had a lot of leaks and there's been a lot of reporting about the palace intrigue and who's kind of stabbing this one in the back and the, the kind of power We never had any of that in the no, White House. No, no. <laughs> well, this, it's, in a way, that has been more open, uh, probably for a lot of different reasons because you had a lot of people kind of jockeying for power and also... Uh, it was kind of set up in a way where you had people kind of just going at each other, trying to send a message even to the president by getting into the papers. Uh, I do think though, you still have this, I think you kind of have two competing things happen, happening at the same time. Very powerful people are still able to kind of shape the message on social media, through television, through all these things. And you, do, you still have a White House that is able to drive its own message even though it can be divergent at times but you still have that ability to even to kind of just set the terms of a debate because you're very powerful and it's not just the presidency it's congress it's corporations everyone so you have that and then you also have kind of a lot of anonymous people and all these people who can go in and that's what you saw with the russians and all that being able to come in and kind of just like throw rhetorical bombs in, in there, throw grenades and kind of see what happens and kind of set stuff off because you still have that ability. So you kind of have, you have two things kind of working against each other, or working in parallel, not necessarily towards the same goals. But if you want to wreak some havoc, you can. You can do that through social media. And that's what you saw in this last election. If you want to get people worked up, you can tweet a certain thing and start, you know, and get people going even like with the things that happened with the, the private school boys from Covington and the Native American and all of that, it was like some anonymous account that really got that blown up, right? Like you, if you wanna throw some things in and get people moving, you can do that. The problem is you don't know necessarily what is driving that and what is the aim. And as we've seen, there are hostile actors who are using that. Aisha, go ahead. Well, I wanted to build off of one thing because it reminded me of something. There, there's an interesting paradox in the sort of information, information ecosystem that we're in right now. I mean, it, when everyone has a voice, it's, no one has a meaningful voice or a voice with real impact. Um, and yet, what I have noticed is that because it is so easy now to move ideas and information around, some voices are still created more equal than others. Um, I mean, I'm good friends with Tom Friedman from the New York Times. And if Tom Friedman still today writes about something in his column, it gets shipped around all over the place. It especially gets shipped around among what we call influencers in our business, people who have an impact on decision making at corporate level, at policy level around the world. 
Um, I remember towards the end of the Obama administration, and I don't remember what the issue was, but they had an announcement they needed to make, and they wanted to do a conversation with the president as the voice, and instead of going to one of the broadcast networks, or instead of going to one of the cable networks, they brought Tom in. And he did a 30-minute interview um, you know, on video with the president that was put up on NewYorkTimes.com. And from what Tom told me, it got 8 million views uh, within a matter of 36 hours. Um, and, you know, the, of course, then it was tweeted and shipped around and all kinds of things. So it, it, we are, there is that paradoxical fact that there are some voices that still have an impact. You have to figure out how you're going to use them to better effect in, in this environment. Right, that, that promise of the democratizing effect of these media has not always been um, fulfilled in a lot of ways. Aisha, I was going to ask you, because we've, um, we've talked about the ways that White Houses have changed their communication styles, but over the past like 20 years or so, journalists have come under a lot of heat to change the way that they cover presidents, whether it's too much access journalism or too biased or what have you. What have the newsroom conversations been like about how you deal with those criticisms? I, I, for, for me, those conversations are always something that you're grappling with and wrestling with. And I don't know that the news industry has really come up with a good answer. There was a lot of this after 2016. What should we be doing? You know, did the media miss this? How did they miss it? Who should they be talking to? And I, if you sit 20 journalists down, you'll get 20 different answers for that. And I think also because I think for me, the public also is not really decided on what they want the media to do. It, when you look at the criticism that you will see of journalists today, you will see criticism, especially for White House reporters, it will be, you are too easy on this president, you guys are gonna get him reelected, you want him to get reelected, you hear that. Then you'll hear, you guys hate him, you won't give him a chance, you will never, you know, you're just trying to bring him down. What is wrong with this media? I don't know how you satisfy those two groups. I don't know if it's possible, right? Like I don't, I think as journalists, what journalists have tried to do is to raise questions and to press where they can and to expose where they can. And, and, and journalists that I know aren't trying to put their thumb on the scale either way. But there are real questions of the way you cover things, who you give coverage to in this election season. Who gets coverage and why do they get coverage? Why do certain people get more coverage than others? Why, why aren't women getting more coverage? Why aren't people of color getting more coverage? So those decisions and how we determine who's electable and who's not and the question of how you cover President Trump and whether you should be covering his every, every movement, should you ignore some of his tweets. A lot of that you do end up doing, but it's like what should get the attention? And you have questions like that with the caravan that was coming before the midterms when President Trump was talking about that over and over again. Should that have gotten coverage? And there were a lot of people who said it should not have been covered. You shouldn't cover it because President Trump is using that to push his immigration agenda. I think what you what is happening now at the border I think bears out the idea that you did need to cover that issue because his opinions on the caravan have affected policy going forward. But those are the debates that people have. Yeah, I couldn't imagine <coughs> attempting to be a journalist in this environment right now. I think if you see some of the best work out of journalism, it's usually based on context and reflection. They have an opportunity to look at events and look at it from multiple dimensions, go deep, and, and do in-depth reporting. That is just, there's no way that that's being rewarded right now in the, in the type of news environment in which you're being uh, asked to have so many, many clicks and, you, and the cycle keeps going and it's just drive-by reporting. Um, that, that in itself is very difficult. And then you layer on top of it the fact that journalism itself has been being disintermediated as an industry. So a journalist not only has to worry about keeping up, but has to worry about whether they're gonna have a job at the same time. You can't divorce the personal from the professional in these situations, so. And then, I think on our side of the, of the ledger, whether it's when we're in government or in corporate America now, is that the practitioners on our side, I think, become too reliant upon technology. And we don't have the type of rela human relationships with journalists 
that I get onto my teams all the time is that it's not satisfactory just to text a report or just shoot an email saying they didn't like something or this or that. Have a conversation. I used to always say in the White House is that if we allow for the press to cover the, the presidency, the White House, they are not, they're going to dehumanize it. I said, if we can get them to cover old George W., we got a shot. And, and so, and that requires human interaction. That requires investing in relationships. This things will kind of probably have larger societal implications outside of just journalism. But I think those things are, all these things are happening at the same time. And, and it's making the, the role of journalism and the role of those on the other side that much more difficult. Yeah. I, I think, I agree. I think it must be so difficult to be a journalist in this, at this level now trying to get this done. I can't even imagine it. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we didn't have all of these inputs to have to deal with when I was a journalist or when I was on the other side of it. So it's pretty outrageous. I do think, first off, Dan's right, the business model for journalism in this country is under severe threat. In fact, let's be honest, it's dying. Um, and we hope that we have enough billionaires who are willing to kind of keep it going because that's really kind of the, the raw material of what's necessary, it seems, at this point. But there are times, I think, where it's important for journalists to, A, remember what you already knew, and two, kind of go off the tweet. Get away from that. So I, if I could, there's one story that I'm going to pitch it to you. I hope okay. that you'll do something Thank with you. it. Thank you. It's, it's surprised <laughs> me that no one has taken the time to sort of dive into it and do it. So the overarching theory that President Trump wants to send to everyone is that all this stuff with the tweets and whatever positions he takes, it's all random, right? Because he's just got such a gut sense about what America cares about. He's just putting it out there, and he does it in this raw fashion, and sometimes he gets in trouble for it, and sometimes it works, and it keeps his 40% happy, and it's always about sort of issues that have a little bit of a wedge to them, right, that are sort of driving people, and he just does that because he's this mad genius, so I don't believe it. So what I said when I said, remember what you already knew, Kelly Ann Conway, what was she before she went to the White House? She's a pollster. I've not seen a single story, and we had them all the time, because there's, believe it or not, a lot of political polling in politics, uh, <laughs> and uh, about the polling that this White House must be doing constantly, about which issues to take on that are going to kind of keep his base hot, and how to approach them. And I would actually bet you that when he comes up with the Sleepy Joe moniker for Joe Biden, they thought about, they tested, should it be Sleepy Joe or Drowsy Joe? And Sleepy <laughs> tested better, and also Trump can't spell drowsy. So, you know, that's, I, I'm just telling you that that's a story. Uh, that used to be a story for us that they slammed us with all the time, and I'm not just saying tit for tat, but we need to know, because th this suggests that there's something else going on behind that curtain than what we understood. Okay. So anyway. Uh, thank you. Take that. <laughs> I like that idea of A-B testing these different the, insults. The, the nicknames, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you one last question before we open it up to audience questions. Um, you know, there have been these really profound technological media changes over the past generation. And in the past, what we've seen, you know, when radio shows up on the scene, you get a president like Franklin Roosevelt who knows how to use that to provoke an intimate relationship with the American people television rolls around and JFK, you get a particular kind of president that comes, uh, that comes to meet those media moments. How are these new technologies of cable news and social media changing what it is that Americans look for in a president? That's a great question and putting it in that frame, uh, even looking at, looking at an Obama, looking at uh, a President Trump, what you see is presidents who did write or who did meet kind of the mediums of their time. And I, I, and I also think that because you're seeing where people are able to talk to the public so directly, you are seeing a willingness of the public to take a risk on people who may not have as much experience, who may not be as known political quality or you know, a known politically, but they feel like they know them and they trust them and they like them and they're really to, willing to kind of take that risk. And with Trump, you do see someone who take, 
who was able to take social media and to take what drives that and to really turn that into a platform for himself. And what you see with Beto O'Rourke and all these other people, they are also using social media in their own way to drive these things. Elizabeth Warren is on Twitter, you know, trying to help people with their love lives. If you look into any of that, like she's, like she's got a plan for that. Like they are trying to personalize themselves. And so you are seeing a very intimate view of the presidency and you're seeing a presidency that is not as removed. It's a human, right? It's a human side to it. You get, when you have a human as president, well, they're all humans, but you, when you kind of <laughs> humanize Don't them. Don't get carried away. <laughs> <laughs> but when you got, like, but it also kind of removes some of the stature, right? This is modern day presidential. This is not old school presidential. This but, is, yeah. Yeah, so you get some that, of that. Yeah, one thing that's interesting, because all the people you referenced who are, are good practitioners, good community. They're good communicators, but then they've just taken that good communication skills and then they've used through experts around them to leverage technology. What we haven't had yet in a president is a digitally native president. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got, we're, we're possibly gonna have two 70 year olds running for uh, in 2020 uh, in their 70s with Biden and, and, and Trump. And, you know, Mayor Pete would probably be the first, Beto's not even really, he's, 48, 49 years old. I mean, they're all good at using the tech, but it'll be interesting if once we skip into which will be digitally native uh, candidates and how much that it even accelerates more in how they, they use the tools or how they, they fundamentally change the way communications, not only from the White House, but they set the tone because one thing Don will tell you is that the tone is set at the top in any organization, particularly in the White House. And um, that's why he's gone through three communications directors. I don't At think they least. even have one right who, now. Who's yeah. Trump? Trump. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. He's, gone he's his own communications ones. director yeah. And, yeah. and dictates all that what is going to happen there. But it'll be interesting through this cycle. I don't think there'll be a, I don't think Mayor Pete will make it. I think he'll be relevant for a while. But it'll be, and so we're, their teams are all digitally native individuals on it, but it'll be interesting when the principal is, how and, much more it changes. And I think you're getting a glimpse of that with AOC, who I think is the yeah, first like, very good example. nationally very good example. digitally native. Very good example. What do you think, any I, big changes? I think, look, I think, as I said at the start, I think social media is a complete game changer uh, in every way, and how to use it, and, and what's the most effective ways to use it. And we've seen with Trump the sort of outer edges of this, which is, I say, I don't think is random and unplanned. I think it is actually probably pretty constructed. Uh, but how we get there and use it, of course there is the risk of overexposure and, and overload because we're told that these, these media uh, require authenticity. And of course if you can fake that, you've got it made. And <laughs> I, I, I just think that um, we don't know the outer edges of this yet. Uh, and, it, but it, it, and it will be quite interesting to see the extent to which, as Joe Biden moves through this process, he's able to take, take advantage of it in a way mm -hmm. uh, or not. Uh, whether he gets into battles with Trump you know, on social media or he decides to reserve himself from that. So, I, I mean, we're at the beginning of that age. But, you know, think about, you talked about FDR and you talked about JFK and radio and television. So, of course, FDR was uh, uh, disabled, uh, which most of the country never knew, but it was the tenor and the timbre of his voice and his selection of words and his use of metaphor and analogy and things like that that he was able to convey to the country directly when, when you know, two-thirds of the country would listen to his fireside chats. And JFK, you know, was a, a, a great master at being able to convey through television, and presidents kind of came to terms that. There's some fascinating, funny stories about the use of television over time, but, you know, we get all the way forward. And I don't say this cynically to Michael Deaver, who was the communications mastermind with Ronald Reagan, who famously said that it doesn't matter what he says, we turned the sound down, we're just looking for the picture, and the image is what matters. And so, you know, we've seen the evolution of this, you know, constantly as we've moved through these different technologies. Excellent. All right, well, we are going to open up to audience questions. Um, people have been texting questions throughout the panel, and we have some wonderful interns here who are going to ask away. Our first question is, um, in the new opinion-driven media age, what recommendations do you all have for efficiently consuming news 
um, to have a well-rounded review of news and opinion. Well, what? I, 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 have a couple, I have a couple of things to say, but I'd like to hear what you say. What I recommend people to do when they're trying to get the news is consider the source. As journalists, we always, you know, they say if your mom says she loves you, check it out. Um, so always look, <laughs> look into, like, who is telling me this and how are they proving to me that this is true? Don't just take a headline or they say this is happening. Well, how do they know it's happening? What are they using to back it up? Is it just, and if it is anonymous sources, you can look at that. Like, is it, are they saying it's a person familiar with this person's thinking? That means that someone very close could be the person, although I wouldn't recommend that as a sourcing method. But it could be, you can look at how are they standing this up. If they found this treasure trove of documents and emails and phone calls and they got videos, that's a different type of story than just kind of someone putting something out there and saying, oh, I believe this happened. So I would say try to look critically at what you're reading, not just does it kind of answer what I want it to answer or does it tell me what I want to be told? And I think that's the stuff that you need to be most critical of. Those stories that are exactly what you want them to be and are telling you this person is exactly who you thought they were, I think those are the ones that we as individuals should be the most kind of critical of because they're playing to our own biases. But that's hard to do, but that's what I would recommend. So I would say three things, at least to start. The first one, which is pretty fundamental, is read. Right? I mean, people need to read the news. And that's not taking anything away from our friends in television but, uh, or any other medium. But they, they need, to, it, it would be great for people to pick up a daily newspaper or two or three or four and actually read. Um, and the more we can try to persuade, I guess, young people to do that, because old people like me, it's, it's too late, but more and more for people to do that, number one. Number two, um, uh, two organizations that I've been involved with, two and three. One is called the News Literacy Project. Uh, it was started by a former Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the LA Times, uh, and its whole purpose is about getting news literacy curricula into schools around the country, middle schools and high schools, so that people, young people are, have some training to be able to discern the difference between what's real and what's not real. And again, it's harder and harder, given technology, to be able to do that, but the more we can help people be equipped with that. And the third is an organization, it's a business, called NewsGuard, uh, that some of you have heard of, that uh, has been started by, I sent you something about that, that was started by uh, Steve Brill, who's the founder of the, Amer of the American Lawyer and Court TV, more important, and um, Gordon Krovitz, who's the former publisher of the Wall Street Journal. And they've been uh, sort of media entrepreneurs together for the last decade or so, and they started this business called NewsGuard. And at the end of the day, this is an antiquated reference, it's kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval about news and information sources. There's something like 7,000 news and information sources on the World Wide Web that account for about 98% of what everyone consumes. And they've gone through and they have rated every one of them with a green light or a red light. And it's not based on political anything, Brill, basically is a liberal Democrat, and Gordon is a Wall Street Journal Republican. And they, they are, um, but they have a series of about eight criteria that are really what you would imagine are fundamental for journalism to be good journalism. And they have hired not algorithms, they have hired real people, journalists, editors, who have gone through and rated all 7,000 of those. And it's a, uh, like there's a web browser, you can sort of get it that lays on top of what you search, so that when you search uh, oil excavation and pops up, you know, certain sort of websites that come up because they've been search engine optimized, you're going to see whether it's a green or a red in terms of is it real journalism or is it something that either has been manufactured for political reasons or, as Dan and I know, uh, for purposes of corporate interest, you know, that are not about real journalism. Um, that's also a good tool. But all of this at the end of the day is about people actually stepping up and trying to be more responsible about things. I think we all imagine ourselves as victims of this technological age, and we have to take responsibility again. Yeah, I mean, I think those efforts are good, and we need to have those. I think, ultimately, though, any type of filtering system or curation 
whether it's NewsGuard or if you're Facebook, who they have the dilemma of saying, we don't want to be content police. How do we decide what is hateful or not? Um, at the end of the day, I think the way that I've tried to tackle it is, and I use, you know, frankly, I do deep reading, but I mostly do Twitter, and I just force myself to follow people who are on both sides of the spectrum. And so when the Mueller report comes out, I can read six people on Twitter who are hard left, and I can read six people on Twitter on hard right, see what their analysis of it, and I can sift pretty quickly throughout there what the reality really is. It's somewhere in between the two. And so, but it takes more time to do that. You have to force yourself to go maybe read uh, and follow people that you instinctively wouldn't. But that's the only way that you, you got to be your own curator of this, and the only way to do that is, is to cover the spectrum. Right, and not only the spectrum of opinion, but the spectrum of news, I would think. Because I was Sources. thinking about That's like right. having a newspaper, the actual physical act of reading a newspaper. You're exposed to stories that you wouldn't normally well, click you, on or read. Yeah, right? so Twitter's kind of like the new AP wire. I mean, it's like the wire service yeah. for you. It just, you know, because you're following all the news organizations <laughs> that are on Twitter, but then you follow the opinions that are on Twitter as well. And so you can quickly go through the feed on any given day of what the news events, and by, if you have the right curation of sources, you can get a pretty quick read about what really is happening. I like this. A lot of Twitter love, which you don't normally get on media and politics panels these days. Do we have another question? The media has been criticized for its coverage of the 2016 election. So how should the media approach the 2020 election? Better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, this idea. Like, there has been a lot of soul searching in the media about 2016. I don't know that there has been one place that has landed. There is a goal for more policy coverage. There is really a goal to be out there talking to a lot of people. Uh, I don't want to do a shameless plug, but I think NPR does a really good job of getting out and talking to people and real people. Um, so shameless plug there. But that's part of what people, I, I think that's part of what the media is trying to do. How do you get away from the horse race journalism? How do you get away from being so poll focused? And, and part of it is what do people want to read? Are they going to read these kind of more substantive pieces about you know, kind of the minutia of policy? And different news outlets will have different, uh, will have different audiences and different goals that they're trying to reach. So I don't know if people will be really satisfied with the coverage of this presidential election. I know that we will hear about it and we will hear about whether they're satisfied or not. That's what I know for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's easy to kind of be a scold about this because it's very hard to do it, but try, the media need to cover more about what is happening rather than what they hope will be happening. And it's very difficult when you're a journalist to keep your own preferences out of where the facts lead you. And I think the more that we can, the journalists can be out there, the media have the opportunity to be out there truly understanding what's going on in the country um, and among people, uh, the better off we'll be, which again is easier said than done, but I think it's essential. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't think you can divorce it from the economics of journalism right now. And, if, and you know the whole line, if it bleeds, it leads. The reality is for many, they are organizations that are financially strained and they have to remain relevant, which means ratings, which means clicks, which means eyeballs in any form or fashion. And, that's, and, and then you have on top of that, and we, you know, look, when there was a White House press conference or out on the campaign trail, I think our hit rate on predicting which journalist would ask which question was about 99.9%. .9%. I mean, we, you knew exactly, based on what was going on in the news and the personalities of the journalists, what they were going to ask. They want to be on the front page. They want to lead the, the broadcast that night. They want to be, and that's understandable, and, and, and you have to operate under that context. But with this dynamic going on in journalism and the economics of journalism being under such pressure, and I, and I it, I hate to say what you said, Donald, which is like, I hope a bunch of billionaires keep buying these organizations, but if, if, journal, if journal, journalistic institutions or, or media properties 
can take a longer view of things versus having trying to get the instant gratification of, of ratings. That is a challenge, and this is not going to get any better in this next cycle. In fact, it will probably get worse. And even though we're more informed about the bots and all the things about the, the bad actors, the capabilities of them are exponentially more effective and will be more effective in 2020 than it was in 2016. And they're not just going directly at the candidates themselves. I mean, we see the Russians and others are just trying to sow social disruption. I mean, I, in my day job, we saw it last year. Um, it was a, a, um, a inaccurate report about a food uh, uh, illness in that it came from a, a product from one of our stores. And before we caught up with it, it had already been shared over 800,000 times, and it was a Russian bot. We figured it out that it was. It wasn't even true. And so they're just looking for anything that sh shows that sows divisiveness or rush. So it's not particularly just about the candidate anymore. And I think that's only going to get, and obviously the social media companies are coming under a lot of scrutiny. They're, they're going to do their best, and it's not going to be enough. So I think we should just prepare ourselves for a, an incredibly toxic environment. And I, unfortunately, we know this. We were talking about it earlier is that the, the tone of the presidency is incredibly important, and in, in even very honorable um, presidents at times in campaigns want to win, and, and you'll see it, uh, at times where they will do things, they'll look back on it and regret, but oftentimes when they get into the White House, they end up doing the right thing. I can't say that right now, and, and I think if we have a strategy that's playing off of some of our worst fears, and then except for as opposed to our best hopes, it's gonna it, it's gonna incent them. And, and and I can give four examples on the other side where it's the same. So it's not just Trump, but the tone is set by the president. So I think we got to we got to buckle up and prepare for a pretty toxic environment in the next two years. Well, on that upbeat note, <laughs> sorry. Please help me thank our panelists for a great. <laughs> Thank you. It was another terrific panel. Just as a reminder, lunch, uh, the lunch sessions, you need ticket 2B. They start at, two th at 12.30 in Newcomb Hall and then back here at 2.30 for the afternoon panels and you'll need tickets 2C.